Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the X's and O's with Greg Hosell. I am Doug Farrar with Touchdown Wire on the USA Today Sports Media Group. And the guy over there is Greg Hosell of NFL Films and ESPN's NFL Matchup. And Greg, 15 days before the draft as we do this. Uh, when it goes up, it'll be two weeks. So <laughs> it's crunch time. It's uh, rubber meets the road. And last year when we, I think it was the second or third episode we did of this iteration of stuff we've been doing together for like 10 years. Uh, we went into the paths to success for the top draftable quarterbacks in the 2023 class. I wanted to do that again, and we have five guys that we're going to discuss, but really this is more of a 30,000-foot level thing where we're talking about the, the transitive properties for quarterbacks going from college to the NFL. And just a, a couple of things to get into before we talk about these guys. When transitioning for quarterbacks to the NFL level, kind of the universal things to watch, I mean, ball placement, anticipation, the plan under pressure. When you watch quarterbacks in a class, regardless of the year, regardless of the quarterback, what are the sort of non-negotiables you need to see to a greater or lesser degree, depending on the quarterback's style, for success in the national football? Well, I think that if you're – We'll get into a little more detail, obviously, but I think if you're starting and you're looking at it from 30,000 feet, you, you'd have to say that you'd have to be able to make the, the right decision. You have to be able to understand that you have to throw it to the right receiver at the right time with the right kind of throw, and that throw needs to be precise in terms of ball location. In other words, accuracy. Um, if you cannot throw the ball with accuracy, you place it where you want to place it, then it's really hard to play quarterback in the league. Um, yeah. Most coaches would tell you that decision-making, which is basically what I just said about throwing to the right receiver at the right time with the right kind of throw, is a critical element. And along with that goes being able to see the field with clarity. Uh, with uh, just in, in, this is where I wanted to get into one of my favorite Greg Cosell phrases, elimination and isolation. Let's get into that because that's right. super important. Right. Now, I... I, I chose to use that term a number of years ago. It's essentially the same as processing, which became kind of a cliched term. But what you have to do as a quarterback is, and, and it really starts pre-snap for the, the really good ones. And then again, that's we can debate how many really good ones there are um, and what's involved in transitioning to the NFL. But what you have to do is think of it this way. You're going to take a snap and you're going to have only a certain amount of time to deliver the football based on the play call or the route concepts, the route design, the, your drop. Your drop syncs up with the, the route concepts. So let's say you have anywhere th – three-step drop is 1.5 seconds. Five-step drop timing is 2.1 seconds. Seven-step drop timing is 2.6 seconds. So think about that. Think about how quick that is. So what you have to be able to do – is eliminate what's not there and isolate where you, what is there and where you're going with the ball in that brief amount of time. Now, what offensive coordinators try to do, obviously, is have the primary read be available so that you're not necessarily going through an entire elimination, isolation, progression process on every drop back. Right. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, you can make it happen more often in normal down and distance situations, first and 10, second and three. That's where your play calling, your use of personnel, your formations, any number of factors can, can weigh to the advantage of the offense and the quarterback. But then when you get into the, th the third down longer situations, the sort of critical high leverage situations where the defense has theoretically and practically as well a tactical advantage, then your quarterback has to be able to do that without the benefit of being able to sort of dictate to the defense. They're kind of dictating to you. So right. you have to be able to eliminate what's not there with defenses that are moving both pre-snap and post-snap. You have More to be than able ever now. More than ever now. In the last right. five years, coverage switches have increased exponentially. So Correct. It's a lot harder. Correct. There's a lot of... of, of post-snap coverage, movement, and rotation. So you have to be able to eliminate where not to go with the ball and isolate where to go with the ball within that brief amount of time. Um, would you say just – I'm sorry to break in. Would no, you no, say that's fine. The 1.5, the 2.2, the 2.5, with those coverage switches, does that sort of cut the time in half? 
as far as what you're reading because the post snap look is so different? Well, no, because it doesn't change the timing and rhythm of, of drops and route concepts. No, it's not as if all of a sudden you have no, a, I mean, a time for the process. If you're, if you know, you're going to get cover three, you know, you, and you have X amount of time to read it, but it switches from cover three to say two man. And all of a sudden, Oh crap, I had this three read. Now I got to figure this out. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's where the really good quarterbacks kind of figure that out seamlessly. They, they, they're not sitting there going, Oh, it just changed. What do I do? Oh yeah. Now I know what I do. It, yeah. it, it happens seamlessly. Um, so yeah, but that, that comes with experience. Some quarterbacks are better at it than others. We've seen that Brock Purdy at a very young age is good at, at that kind of thing. You know, he can, innately feel coverage rotation and know where to go with the football. We saw CJ Stroud be pretty good at it this year um, with the Houston Texans. Um, but, you know, all these things factor in to sort of the evaluation. And some of these things are hard to see when you watch college quarterbacks because the game is so different. The hash marks are further apart. There's a wide side of the field that's really wide. You can always complete a ball to the wide side of the field in college, which is why completion percentages in college football can often be very misleading, particularly when they're high. They can be very misleading. Um, you don't see a ton with few exceptions of late coverage rotation in college football. Um, so there's so many factors in college that make it relatively speaking easier for the quarterback and relatively speaking easier for the play caller. So. Right. There's a lot of things as you try to transition quarterbacks to the league that you just don't know. Um, now, there are certain things you can know and you can't see on film, but there's some things that are somewhat unknowable. Um, yeah. But if you feel when you watch a quarterback in college, a couple of things, if you feel that he's not particularly precise with his ball location, if you feel that he's not seeing the field real well in college, um, if you feel that based on on the times it may happen that he doesn't have a strong sense of, of route concepts and progressions. Um, it's hard to have a passing game in the NFL without progression reading. So it does tend to limit your options. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's certain things you try to look at and then at the end of the day, you still have to project and extrapolate. You just, you know, there's no automatics, you know, we like to think there are. Um, and obviously, you know, in this draft class, people seem to think Caleb Williams is, I guess we'll find out. Um, right. But there's no automatics because there's just so many factors and variables involved. And then you get to the coaching part. How is it coached in the NFL? There's a lot of things we just don't know watching tape um, that, you know, we don't know how things are coached. Um, well, and uh, the, the next thing about it, you brought up Purdy, and I always go back to Justin Herbert and Oregon's offense where I'm like, God, he's missing flat routes. What's going on here? And then he gets to the Chargers and it's like, oh, now I see the whole picture. And with Purdy, you watch his college tape, and, I mean, he was decent, but there's a reason he was Mr. Irrelevant. The, the, the high-level ability to diagnose coverage switches, the, you know, the feel in the pocket, all the things that he brought to the NFL. And I know Brian Greasy, who was on the Niner staff, was instrumental in bringing Purdy in and, and yep. Greasy with him a lot. So you get that development. But talking about the unknowables, before we get into the path to success for these quarterbacks we're going to discuss – there are things that show up in the NFL and it goes both ways where a guy can be great in college and just collapse in the NFL. But a guy like Purdy, I mean, how do you, how do you even begin to, as you said, project these things that you can't see and don't know based on the offense he was in in college and sort of the skill set he had, which can later be unlocked by NFL coaching. That, that to me is the tough part. Yeah. And it, a lot of that's unknowable. And, and, you know, I think the people who, pretend as if they know for sure whether a guy is going to be good or great or average, that's impossible to know. I think coaching becomes critical. I mean, you yep. mentioned Brock Purdy. Don't forget that offense, because of what they do, is so well schemed. They do such a good job in normal down and distant situations that they can really define throws for Brock Purdy. Now, right. obviously, there's going to be times where he has to read and, and coverage changes. We know all that. But that's why coaching becomes so critical. And we just don't know the answer to that. I mean, a lot of people, for instance, are talking about, hey, whoever Kevin O'Connell drafts with the Vikings has a really good chance to be a good player because Kevin O'Connell has both a, a Rams background with McVay. He was with uh, Kyle Shanahan when they were all with the Washington 
Redskins back at that when they were the Redskins. So he has a really strong understanding of how to create more more defined, cleaner looks for the quarterback through the use of personnel, formations, um, route concepts, m- uh, motions. Motion. You know, all, O'Connell's big on creating. Right. All those things yeah. factor in to, you know, Bobby Slowick came from the Niners. Yeah. Um, so you saw what happened with the Texans. All these things factor in, but so many of them are unknowable. So all you can do, and I imagine you do the same thing, is you look at a quarterback's traits and his attributes, and you have to start there. I mean, obviously, if you don't think a quarterback is particularly skilled, you're not going to say, oh, man, he's going to be a great pro. But once you get beyond the traits and the attributes, um, and different people ascribe different values, Doug, to, to the attributes. I mean, my guess is the attributes would be very much the same, just a listing of them, of the traits for all quarterback coaches they'd be the same but what value do you ascribe to each one of those traits you know some might say hey the total non-negotiable for me i don't care if the guy is a four to three burner and he can make a ton of plays but you know what if it's third and six and he can't put it right on the hands of the receiver for an eight yard gain i don't care what else he can do that's not going to work for me um you know yeah and i'm just giving examples you know right so so it all depends on what kind of value you ascribe to particular traits. Um, the value, and different yeah. coaches see it differently. The value of the attributes, you're talking about the, the Shanahan play design, which is you know half the NFL is running iterations of what Kyle ran and the ones that aren't are running iterations of what, what they run. But, you know, the Niners like gave up a ton of draft capital to move up and take Trey Lance. And two years later, he's like the Cowboys third. St- right. With, with Kyle, and this is proven out and he's discussed it. He doesn't want a random play generator. That's not what he wants. He's like, I've got this perfect machine. I want you to drive the car. I don't want you to be the car. So his value of attributes might be completely different than what Andy, I'm, they're Kyle Shanahan and Andy Reid are two brilliant guys. It's not right or wrong. It's, it's just your preference. And, you know, Andy's been talking about spread concept, concepts for 12 years. He gets Mahomes. Now he has the perfect guy to drive that car. So your point about. But Andy would not say, just to interrupt, Andy would not say, you know what? Running the offense the way it's structured, it does not matter. It's not important to me. He would never say that. Oh, no, no, no. Because no. Andy, I know Andy, and he works so hard to, yes. to structure it. He just happens to have a special, special player. You know, I. One of the things that I think people have to understand, and to use an educational term, you can't major in Mahomes. Mahomes is a special quarterback. You can't assume when you watch other quarterbacks coming into the league, and we can certainly talk about Caleb Williams, well, he's going to be Patrick Mahomes. Well, first of all, we don't know whether he is or isn't, but it's very tough to compare to, to greatness. It's, it, it's when, for instance, years ago, and you'll remember this, I remember when Jake Plummer came in the league and it was, he's Joe Montana, you know, and again, no knock on Jake Plummer, but it's very hard to compare quarterbacks to guys that just have a special feel and a special way of playing at the highest level. You know, y- you can't, Caleb Williams played at USC in a conference that doesn't play very much defense. And unfortunately, that conference is now defunct, which is a shame, but that's a conversation for another time. But as a Seattle resident, I don't even want to talk about it. Yeah, but but the point being is that you can't automatically say, well, you know what? He's going to come into the league and he's going to be Patrick Mahomes. Right. Maybe he can be, you know, and, and I know teams have to decide what they think he will or won't be. And there's differing opinions on that, by the way. Um, so we don't know the answer to that. But my point is that you can't just take a special, special quarterback and start comparing them. You have to look at what what do you want and what do you believe makes a quarterback successful. At some point in the NFL, your quarterback has to play within the structure of the offense. Mahomes can do that. Obviously, Mahomes can do that. Right. I'm not intimating at all that Andy Reid is uh, an unstructured because I would be an idiot if I said that. I- it's just and and you brought up Montana. I believe Phil Sims was in that same draft class. He was, Montana. and that's who Bill Walsh wanted. Yeah, but and you know he worked out Phil Sims, and he said you know and Sims was just like you know how it's her thriller, and and Walsh was like Phil, I want you to slow down. I want you to you know pay more attention to your drop. It was more of an artistic thing as opposed to just zinging the ball over right. the place. So that's another case of 
the attributes are the same, but they're valued differently from coach to coach, which I think no, it's, it's a really interesting point. No question. Um, and that's why it's, it's you know, and, and it, which raises another question now that we're speaking about Mahomes and Caleb Williams, it, and it gets to the same question of what, how do you ascribe value on the spectrum of traits? Now, more than ever before, there is more value placed on the ability to make plays above the X's and O's, outside the structure. But what's, what's in a sense, without making it a mathematical equation, what's the percentage of that? You can't live in an offense where you basically say to your quarterback, you know what, let's just run around and make some plays today. You know, you can't really do that. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic or funny, right. but I think a lot of people – the way they talk about it, and we're all on social media because we have to be. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about people who do this for a living. Okay. At some point, you know, they're starting to talk as if, well, if you can't run around and make plays, you can't play. Again, where do you fall on that? You know, you still have to be able to drop back and play with some semblance of timing and rhythm and make throws from the pocket, throwing it to the right receiver with the right kind of throw. Um, with, with precise ball location. You've got to be able to do that to some degree. Well, let's – we get into Michael Penix, Jr. I, I, that's going to come up because there's a difference between moving and pocket movement, which, you know, that's a thing. But let's get into the paths to NFL – the transitive paths to NFL success for these quarterbacks, and we'll get into as many as we can. I have five listed, and we'll see how we go. But Caleb Williams, when you look at – the, the pluses and minuses, and I don't want to do a laundry list. We're not going to talk about each quarterback for 10 minutes and, you know, show plays and do scouting reports. What is the best way for Williams with his attributes and deficiencies, the things he needs to work on? What is the best type of offense for him? And he's going to be a day one starter the, I mean, right. with the Bears. Right. <laughs> we all kind of know this. So, I mean, day one and then two or three years down the road, what kind of offense – do you want to build for Williams to take advantage of the things he does well and to build on the things that he still needs to sort of develop? Well, I would say theoretically any offense would work for one reason. The one thing that he really has going for him is he controls the ball really well. He, he knows where the ball's going when he throws it. Okay. For the most part. Okay. Now you, you can find examples of any quarterback, by the way, making phenomenal throws and missing some that he should make. You can always find examples of either one. It depends, you know, how you want to go about do, doing it. But for the most part, he controls the ball really well. Um, I think what you really want to work on with him when you get him is to really get his his technique and fundamentals really mastered. Because yeah. the throws he missed came from poor fundamentals, not because he cannot control the football. And, you know, when you play in college with a lot of the air raid principles, which he did play with under Lincoln Riley, there is a lot of that almost those one step drops where the fundamentals go out the window and you're throwing the ball with your feet parallel. You're throwing the ball sideways, you know, and he missed some routine throws doing that. So you want to make sure that he's a fundamentally sound player, particularly from the waist down, because he controls the ball really well. Um, now, the the other thing that he obviously has and it will come into play certainly because it will is he does have really good movement and and a real feel for movement he's not uh, yeah the, he has a real good feel for the chaos around him and he'll throw around yes. that without it affecting what he does yes he has a, a really good sense of how to navigate chaos and yeah. and that's uh, that's an important trait to have um he does have really good spatial awareness. Now, he's not the best athlete on the planet, but he certainly moves well enough. Um, and he sees things well on the move. So that's a trait that he does possess. Um, but again, you know, that's not the way you're going to start teaching him. That's not what Shane Waldron is going to do on day one of OTAs, assuming the Bears draft him. When they get to rookie camp, he's not going to say to Caleb Williams, you know what, Caleb? You're really good running around making plays. So that's all we're going to do. We're not going to really teach you the offense. We're just going to have you run around and make plays. That's not right. going to happen. So you've got to work on just what I said. you got to start with the footwork, the fundamentals, so you don't miss easy throws. You've got to work on the timing because, you know, he made timing throws. We're not going to sit here and say he never made timing throws. But you didn't see a lot of, 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 let's say, tight window throws in the middle of the field. Again, that offense didn't ask him to do that. 
There were certain things he wasn't asked to do at the college level in terms of kinds of throws that he's going to be asked to do and then you have to do at the NFL level. Is he physically capable of doing it? Absolutely. But if you haven't done it at the highest level, there is a, a learning curve and there's you have to gain experience being able to do that. Uh, the UCLA game in particular, I noticed he was like throwing just off time against pressure and, and some pretty simple slants were off. So, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, there's just developing the. Yeah, I mean, is he is he a really talented guy for the most part? Yes, he is. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, th- there there was there were times where there was a glaring lack of timing and, and, and rhythm with the way he played. Um, I think he's capable of all this. I don't think that it, he's incapable of it, um, but it's, it, it will take some time. Now he'll rely on his ability to get out of the pocket and make plays because that's what happens when you don't feel you see it right away. And, and it's not, you know, the clarity is not there. Then what, what do you do? You move and he's capable of that. So he will do that. Speaking of guys who can move, Jaden Daniels from LSU. Um, I was looking at your scouting reports on the 33rd team after I did mine because, you know, we don't want to read other people's stuff before we do our own. Um, and you had a really interesting point about Daniels. You wrote, you can tell playing the position is a fundamentally sound in a fundamentally sound way with strong mechanics is important to him, which I, I like the way you put that. Can you kind of expand on that? Yeah, I mean, he's a guy that obviously is an explosive straight-line runner, dynamic. I mean, he can run away from people. Um, but – I watched him and I watched him last summer and I watched him obviously this year as well. Um, He's not a guy who just looks to leave the pocket. Um, You know, he's got, he has an innate willingness to work from the pocket. He wants to read it out. You did see progression reading in the context of their offense. You did see him work through progressions. I think he's improved significantly with his pocket command. Um, You know, so he can, he can sit in the pocket and, and he's got really light, easy feet to him in the pocket you know he drops back the, his ball carriage which is where you hold the ball is really good um you know he, he he's compact he's tight he's fundamentally sound um i thought he was patient from the pocket he, like i said he did not look to leave um no. he works the first two levels of the uh, of the defense really well he's not a power thrower he's not a big armed kid um now there are certain throws that, like, for instance, a slot fade is not an, an arm strain throw. A regular fade is not an arm strain throw. But there are certain deep balls, deeper throws that do require a little arm strength where the ball would lose energy on the back end because he's not yep. a big-armed kid. Um, so, But there's a lot to like about Jaden Daniels. We're going to throw up a deep incompletion against Florida where I, I saw that same thing. But, yeah, the 21-yard stop fade to the league neighbors against Texas A&M uh, – I got to watch tape with him the day before he won the Heisman. We talked about that throw and, you know, how he reads the pylon. And he's just – he's a pretty fade thrower. Yeah, two yeah. notes I made on him. Um, full field reader who can go from touchdown to check down and vice versa. And most of his 17 explosive runs last season were by design. He's not just scrambling and bailing out there. He's got a No, no. He, he's not a guy who just drops back and looks to leave the pocket. So if you're creating the perfect offense for Jaden Daniels, again, day one and then a couple years down the road, what mm-hmm. does that look like? Um, on your OC hat. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a a great question. I mean, you know, there's so much now variation with, with what teams do with form with personnel, first of all, whether you're an 11 personnel, I mean, do you want to spread it out for him? Um, do you want to give him an opportunity to see it more clearly when it's spread? Because if it's spread, number one, now he does have the running element if he chooses to. Um, you know, I'm not sure you want to condense the formation a ton with him early in his career where there's right. more bodies closer to him because that's, you know, that's harder to read for a quarterback early on. You know, where's pressure coming from? Then you have to be really aware of that early on when it's a little more spread out, which is why I mentioned in my notes, I thought 11 personnel, a little more of a spread look, might be the better way to go early on, you know, until he works through all this. Would you want, I mean, because the tight splits, and I've talked to people about this, you and Matt Bowen and others, the tight splits sort of approximate those wider hash marks because – you have more space on the outside for your receivers to to do whatever they're doing. Yeah, um, yeah. 
there there's pros and cons to both. That's the thing. Right. I don't think there's one answer to that. like when you say what offense, I don't think there's one answer to that. Um, right. You know, I think that there, you know, there's many ways in which you can get a quarterback to be successful. There's many different concepts you can run for a quarterback to be successful. Um, you but know, with him, you would probably want to spread it out is what you're saying. I mean, I, that would be my sense. Uh, an offensive coordinator could disagree with me and, and I, he would probably have five valid reasons that would make me say, you know what, you're right, I'm wrong. Um, but I would think that a young quarterback, particularly coming from the college game where the hash marks are wider, I would think that a young quarterback does not want more bodies closer. And also for throwing the ball, because they have to get used to right off the bat the fact that the hash marks are closer and you've got to work the middle of the field where there's more, seemingly more people. I remember having this conversation with Kevin O'Connell yeah, years ago, like yeah. you know, and, and when he was drafted in the third round by the Patriots coming out of um, San Diego state, I believe. Um, and I got to know Kevin well, because he initially started out in our broadcast boot camp before he went into coaching. And he said, man, when he got to the NFL, it just looked like there were 15 defenders out there because he had to make throws in the middle of the field. And that's where a lot of the NFL game is much more so than the college game. And, you know, so sometimes I don't think you want to ask a quarterback to have to deal with that early on, you know, by design. You know, I think you want him to sort of get a sense that, hey, there's space. I can still deal with space. I I mean, I've heard comps to Lamar. I, I tend to think of more as an RG3, but to, put, to go to the Wayback Machine. What type of things did the Shanahan's do for RG three in that in that remarkable rookie year? That might. Yeah, I can't of. remember that specifically, other than the fact that he ran a lot. He ran a lot, yeah. Because he because he didn't he didn't have a lot of passing attempts relative to other quarterbacks in the league. Right. So they you know and that was a lot of that was new then you know it was yeah, very yeah it was other all new with, were like what the hell is he doing with this zone read crap yeah yeah so I mean a lot of that was new so I I can't specifically remember that. Uh, our next guy is Drake May, North Carolina. Um, I want to get into – well, there, there's something I wrote, and I don't I don't know if you'll agree or disagree. We didn't discuss this before. Um, I, th If this makes sense, I think he has a really good feel for route concepts, but I don't know that he's a good anticipation thrower. Does that make sense? Uh, to some degree, yeah. What, what, what would you say about those two things as far as him understanding sort of how routes are – interconnected and then how he throws the anticipation um i mean anticipation you know that there's two things with with that and and it's sometimes very hard to know um there's predetermined throws where here's the play call and and i'm going to throw it for the most part to this guy unless i really believe he's just totally not available and then there's dropping back and kind of reading it and then throwing based on what you see, you know, letting it sort of happen. Um, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between predetermination and anticipation. Um, I think he sees things pretty well. I would say there are times, even when he sees it well, he's a beat late with throws, um, but he's got a really good arm. And at the college level, um, he could do that. Normally at the NFL level, you've got to be a little quicker with that. You can't wait that extra half second. Um, so we'll see. But you're dealing with a guy that you could argue has the best traits of anybody in this draft class because 6'4", 225 is a trait. Um, yeah. So, you know, we'll see. I mean, he's got size. He's got arm strength. Um, for the most part, you know, he, he threw the ball where he wanted to for the most part. Missed yeah. some that are easy, you know. And the then, intermediate stuff got a little weird. Yeah. And I, I know you can say that about every quarterback, but in May's case, it stood out to me a little bit more. Is that my and I, would, I would say that's that's fair. Um, you know, he certainly has that athleticism. Um, I, don't, I don't think he's like misreading a, 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 a rail route. I, to me, it seemed more mechanical, like getting everything started together. Yeah, I mean, I think he missed some some throws that you can't miss without question. And I think that's an area that he's going to have to get better at. Um I think there's one other area that he definitely has to get better at. This can be coached is he had a tendency to drift to his left yep. in the pocket. He drifted off the midline as we call it. And yep. when you do that, you create your own pressure very often because your old line is not blocking for that. So that's a, that's a fixable and coachable problem. Um, hopefully it gets fixed. Um, I think that will help him too, because when you move, 
what happens is, is you, you, you're moving closer to where people are and that just makes you play faster. So, you know, it, maybe that'll clear up. Maybe it'll make him a little more comfortable delivering the ball and take care of some of the erratic ball location, which did occur. Um, but you're dealing with a guy that has really high level traits. I would think that coaches would want to coach him. Again, I don't know the kid, but I would think coaches want to coach him. Um, he was coached this past year in North Carolina by Clyde Christensen, who was in the NFL for years and years and years. And he's coached uh, Peyton Manning. He's coached Tom Brady. He's coached Andrew Luck. So I would imagine that he gave um, Drake May a pretty good sense of what it takes to play in the league. And as we found out, he's been working with Phillip Rivers, who I'm sure has been yep. talking to him about what it takes to play quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, we uh, discussed. We're not going to talk about Bo Nix today because we did a 40 minute film session with Bo. Yeah. But yeah, Bo brought that up that he was working with Rivers and so was May. Um, interesting thing to me, because I think, I mean, this is my opinion, you put him in a heavy play action offense where you know, he, he has kind of easier windows. They didn't run a lot of play action last year, but I, you know, what kind of offense or what kind of schematic characteristics do you think would best fit him in the NFL? Let, let, let me couch the question that way instead of what kind of offense, like what schematic characteristics work best for him? Um, you know, again, you're dealing with a guy that has really high level traits, but I think, I think as an all young quarterbacks, Doug, and, and I, you know, I'm not trying to cop out here, but I think, you're trying to create a situation where you can define the reads and the throws for them. Now, don't forget, if you talk play action, particularly if you put a quarterback under center, you know, they're turning their back to the defense. A lot of college quarterbacks have never, ever done that before. Um, They've also never huddled, which is a totally different thing. And by the way, that's another thing that, you know, we didn't talk about at the very beginning. And that is a bigger deal than people might think, because yeah. now all of a sudden there's a time factor there, too. Not only do you have to get a play out in the huddle, but then you got to get up to the line of scrimmage. Then you got to look at the defense. Then you've got to understand how what you just called versus what the, the defense you're looking at that may stay that way or may change. Um, and all of a sudden the clock keeps winding down. Uh, yep. The play clock I'm speaking about. And you know, all these things factor into the transition. And these are things a lot of people don't really think about. Um, so, you know, I mean, play action, you know, under center, probably something he would need to learn. That's a learned trait. You know, it's when you turn your back to the defense, Doug, if you've never done it, that's a little bit of an issue. It's tough. Yeah. It's like covered switches where you're just removing a, a certain amount of the 2.5 seconds or whatever out of the picture and <laughs> but i would say that when you watch may's tape you see the kind of intermediate and vertical route concepts and combinations that you see in nfl passing games so he clearly has a feel and a comfort level for them um you know obviously there's things to be cleaned up and worked on the question is how will he be coached how quickly can that be cleaned up what are you going to ask him to do you know the other factor is if you go to a team and then who knows where any of these guys are going to go. But if you go to a team that, let's say, doesn't have a great defense and you are forced to throw it 40 times a game or drop back 40 times a game or put up 30 points just to compete, that's not really a good way to develop a young quarterback. No. And some guys just can't get past that, although Jaden Daniels did pretty well the last year. Uh, the next guy we're going to talk about is Michael Panks Jr. And again, we're not going to go, you know, chapter and verse and all these guys, but Obviously, the deep passing volume is ridiculous. Attempted 117 throws with 20 more air yards last season, which is like 30 more than anyone else in the NCAA. Um, as a thrower, you know, no issues. The medicals were clear at the combine. Ran a 4-5 or five at the pro day. Um, I think with him, this is my impression. The And it's not just, you know, you it's not just being blitzed or being, you know, hit. Any sort of color in the pocket really bugged him. And the more I watched him, the more I thought, he really, Penix needs to really develop that feel. And this is where I want to get into pocket movement versus moving in the pocket or moving outside the pocket, that small boxing ring. And I've said before, Brady is the best I've ever seen. I think Joe Burrow is the best in the NFL. I didn't really see that sense from Penix. Like he would throw around the pressure, but I wish he would move around the pressure and give himself, you know, quicker openings to throw. Yeah, you saw it 
very few times. There's a couple of times he did it and you went, wow, he can do that. That's really, really good. But that's something he didn't do a lot of. Um, so now the question is, is that can he do that uh, more consistently at a higher level and, in, in, you know, against the best? Um, that's probably a little bit of, of an unknown. But so there, that's a concern with him. You know, that, that that's my point with all this is there's just some things you don't know. Um, right. But I would say he exhibited some core principles to be, a, you know, a, a higher level passer in the league. Number one, he's got strong arm talent and he, with relatively precise ball location. OK, yeah. he made a lot of difficult throws yeah. at the intermediate and vertical levels. Um, we saw that. We saw him work through progressions with decisiveness and a pretty clear understanding of defensive structures and coverages. We and saw that, was, that was as NFL like an offense as you're going to see from any of these guys. That and that's why. Brian Grubb is now the, you know, OC in Seattle because he yep. ran NFL stuff. Um, yeah, he went like 10 miles down the road and he has a new gig, so there you go. Yeah, um, and, you know, one thing I particularly like is I thought he had an aggressive mindset turning the ball loose, and I think you need that in the NFL. I mean, he had a willingness to make tough throws. Um, now, I think you ask about the kind of offense. He needs a strong pass-protecting offensive line, particularly yes. if he's going to play it early. You know, Which don't he forget. Had with you know your guy Fatanu. <laughs> yeah, yeah and I and I think he needs the interior of the O line to be really yes. good. He needs the depth of the uh, the pass rush to be under control, and that's the center and the two guards. Um, now, the other factor, which some might not enjoy and like, you know, depending on who you are. Again, it gets back to how you look at different traits. Is there are times his his delivery is almost sidearm in you know it reduces his height it makes him appear as if he's 5'10 I guarantee there are going to be some coaches that don't like that and are going to say I don't really want this guy you know you just never you never know how people see things um one thing I really liked about Penix is I thought and I watched him last summer too and I really felt this way watching him in 2022 and it certainly showed up again this year is he's very accountable to the system he yes. wants to run the system as it's designed and he's smart enough to do it. Um, did, did his delivery seem a bit elongated to you? Did you see that as a potential issue? No, I thought it was pretty compact, actually. Okay. Um, our last guy is J.J. McCarthy, and I, they didn't throw the ball around a lot. There were games where they just ran the ball 38 straight times. So it's a bit of an incomplete evaluation. Um, and, I, I mean, I'm I kind of think – and, you know, people are talking about, oh, this team's going to trade up and take him fourth or fifth, and we don't know. Based on the tape, I would say second round, mid-second round. What are your thoughts on McCarthy? And yeah, Murray? he's – It's a tough eval. It's – it's I don't know. I mean, I didn't think his tape was great by any means, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I thought that um, – and, again, it's not a function of how many times he threw it. That's, that's not relevant to me. No. It's not a factor of a uh, function of that. They won the national championship. Um, I, maybe people disagree with me. I don't think that's really relevant to me. I mean, I don't remember in 2015, anybody getting excited about Jake Coker when Alabama won the national championship. And I think they were 14 and one. So, I mean, I, I, that, that, and I know he's won in college and I know he's won in high school and, and that's all good. He also had a really good team, certainly in, in college. They had the best offensive line in college football. They had a dominant defense with, what, eight or nine guys at the combine. Um, I would say that his college tape showed a relatively efficient quarterback that, to me, lacked any special throwing traits. I, he's pretty athletic. I mean, he can get out of the pocket and make plays with his legs. Um, I would say that play extension with the ability to make well-placed throws on the move was a strength of his game. He he's could more, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll succeed on design runs, too. He's more mobile than mine. I would agree. Um, I think watching his tape, you didn't see higher-level arm talent. Um, I thought he really needed to be on balance with a firm base to throw the ball effectively. And by the way, that, that's a good thing to throw on balance, but I thought he needed to be. Um, um, he was clean in the pocket a lot, and he could play in rhythm with room to step up. Uh, then the ball came out pretty well. That's unrealistic to expect that consistently at the next level. I'll be really curious to see when he gets to the NFL how he functions in a, in a muddied and noisy pocket with bodies around him. The 
tape didn't show much of that. He didn't have to move very much to navigate or reset. Um, didn't have to make many, if any, you know, off-platform type throws. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't – it wasn't a matter of, gee, the tape didn't show a lot. I didn't need to see him throw 50 times a game. Um, but we'll see. I mean, the, the, from everything we hear, he's going to be drafted high. Uh, he's been in, – in my own study, which – I just didn't see him as a high, high level prospect, but yet talking to some other people that I respect greatly, they see him as such. And we have, we see him totally differently. So yeah. he's kind of an enigma for me because people I respect talk about him at a really high level. And I just don't think the tape presented that. I think the main issue I had with him and you and I discussed this on the phone a bit uh, this morning uh, and, and it, it it showed up pretty quickly that he needs those designed openings. He needs, he's not, he is not an like an ISO uh, contested catch thrower. He's not a tight window guy. Well, it's and, funny and you say that, that because that I had a, I had a former GM tell me that he made more tight window throws than any quarterback in this draft. And I didn't see that at all. I didn't see that either. Um, I mean, he had one touchdown, I think against, uh, Ohio State. We threw it, but yeah, Ohio State. Two, uh, it was two. He literally uh, threw it to the underneath defender, and it, it. I don't know how it got through, but he he threw it right. He literally threw it to the defender. I'm like, how the hell did you? You were lucky on that one. I, yeah, I, yeah threw, I'm threw, sure threw, his coach said, "Don't ever do that again." Yeah, he threw it to the defender. Yeah. Um, basically. Now the other thing I've heard a lot about with him that people love, um, and then again, it, it's what you ascribe value to. So that's why this is. There's no right or wrongs here. Oh, um, it's all subjective. It's yeah, all um, I've had people, you know, say that he he was really good throwing checkdowns, and I'm not saying that in a funny way, you know. And 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 you know what? There is a, a value in that clearly because if you don't see it clearly down the field, or for whatever reason, you know, hey, take the check down, move on to the next play. There's nothing wrong with that. I wouldn't view that as a reason to say uh, someone is a great prospect, but that that's me you know others might view it that way well what have we what have you and i said over and over and over ad nauseum in the last year and a half uh regarding what the nfl is today it's about creating and defending explosive plays <laughs> above just about anything i don't see jj mccarthy as an explosive play generator and i think that really puts a cap on his ceiling the way the nfl is today so uh, to to finish up with him uh, to ask the same question what are the schematic uh structures and constraints like what will his coach need to know okay i can't do this i can sort of do these things and i can you know fluff them up as much as possible and and th that's where he's a projection and maybe he can do all these things that he that didn't show up on tape maybe in three maybe years or four years no one saw it in college then oh my god you got with the right system. right maybe he's going to be that guy and you know yeah. what if he is that's great that's um, for him. but um you know i think because he played in an NFL offense in college, he played under center. He did turn his back to the defense. He did run play action. He did run NFL route concepts. He does have all that going for him because that's what he did. You know, just because he didn't have to throw the ball 45 times a game, this is how he was taught. This is yeah. so he knows all this stuff. And from everything here, he's an incredibly smart kid. So, well, he was taught by a guy in Jim Harbo who is very tough on quarterbacks. So, Correct. So, I mean, all this factors in positively for any evaluation of, of, of uh, J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, definitely. Well, Greg, as always, you're our QB1. Uh, great stuff. And I, I like that we were able to sort of get into the, the larger discussion about quarterbacks and kind of their paths to success. Uh, great stuff. We'll uh, be back next week with uh, more X's and O's, perhaps a surprise or two. And uh, until then, Greg, we'll be back uh, grinding the tape as much as possible. And uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Doug.